Well, aloha everyone and welcome back to Anatomy 2 here at Chaminade University. Today's lecture is going to cover the special senses. Now, we have several special senses, including smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. And all of these work by way of taking a signal from the external environment that is not electrical and turning it into an electrical impulse in the nervous tissue. Some of these are going to be by way of chemical detectors, such as smell and taste. Some are going to work by mechanoreceptors, such as touch. Some are going to work by, uh, and hearing is also mechanoreceptors, um, and also photoreceptors for vision. Now, smell and taste are the first two that we're going to discuss. These are chemical senses. Um, the human nose has approximately 10 million to 100 million receptors for smell. And these are located in the olfactory epithelium, which is found in the superior part of the nasal cavity. And this olfactory epithelium covers a region known as the cribiform plate. This cribiform plate extends along the superior nasal concha, superior nasal concha, and it's going to be where we're going to have the receptors for smell. Now we have three different types of cells in these regions. We have the olfactory receptor cells, we have supporting cells, and we have basal cells. And you're going to see this as we follow through the multiple different types of senses where we have receptor cells that are going to take a signal, whether it's a chemical signal or a physical signal or a, um, a photo light sensitive signal, and that it's going to be picked up by the receptors and then sent out through the neurons. But what's interesting about receptors is that they are so specialized that they are unable to tend to their own needs. So we need to have support cells that are going to be there to be able to be their nurse cells, basically. They're both going to physically hold these cells up and also take care of their needs. We also have basal cells. This is a stem cell population that is going to serve as a um, subset of cells that we can use for regeneration if we end up with damage or repair to the receptor cells. So that looks kind of like this. Okay, so this is the cribiform plate. The cribiform plate has little holes in it. Um, through those holes, axons of olfactory receptors are going to pile up and then connect on the top part here in the olfactory bulb with olfactory bulb neurons, which will then send that signal out through the olfactory tract. On this side here, this is actual nasal mucus, so this is where we're going to have serous secretions or nasal mucus linings inside our nose. And basically what happens is an odorant molecule is going to make its way up into our nasal cavity. It first has to get past those hairs, etc., and then it's going to end up landing in that mucus. And when it lands in that mucus, then it can dissolve and then bind to the dendrites of the receptor cells. So once something binds to the dendrites, the dendrites can then take that odorant molecule um, and they'll relay that in terms of what came in as a chemical signal. They're going to then change it into an electrical signal and then send that electrical signal out to the olfactory bulb neurons, which then gets sent out through the olfactory tract into the brain. Some other things of interest here, this is the olfactory gland that's going to produce a mucus. That mucus is going to be secreted out and form this mucus layer. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned, the support cells. As you notice, the support cells are not only physically holding up the olfactory receptor cells, but they're also keeping them electrically in insulated. So you notice that the receptor cells don't ever touch one another, and that's so that we don't have crosstalk of information from one receptor to the next. We also have these basal cells here. The basal cells are going to serve as a subset of cells that are going to be able to be involved in regeneration and repair should these receptors end up damaged. Now, if you look at a like microscopic image here on the right, we can see here this line here is where we have the olfactory cilia, then we have the support cells. This here is a duct, similar to here, where we're going to have... Um, mucus coming from the olfactory gland, which is here at the top. So a duct is how we're going to have the mucus secreted out. Um, we also have the receptor cells surrounded by support cells, and inside there the basal cells on top. Again, these are the stem cell populations that will serve as regenerative populations. Now those support cells that we just talked about are used for physical support, nourishment, and electrical insulation for the olfactory receptor cells. Um, and then also the basal stem cells are responsible for replacing olfactory receptor cells after damage. We also have specialty glands that are olfactory glands. They're also known as Bowman's gland. And these are involved in mucus production, such that the odorant molecules are able to dissolve in that mucus. And that's going to allow for the process of transduction. Now, as I mentioned previously, all of these receptors are going to be taking in information that is non-electrical and converting it into an electrical impulse. And that process is called transduction. In this case, they're taking an odorant molecule or a chemical molecule and converting it into an electrical impulse. Now, these receptors have axons, and the axons are going to send impulses along 
until we get to the olfactory nerves. Again, they're going to travel through the cribriform plate to do that and synapse in the olfactory bulb with olfactory nerves. Then those impulses are going to travel along the olfactory tract where they're going to reach regions of the brain for interpretation. The interpretation happens in the primary olfactory area in the cerebral cortex or of the temporal lobe. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you specifics about where things end up in the brain. Um, I do want you to understand, though, that most of these signals are coming in in the form of data, but data is not enough. You also need to have interpretation of the data. So very often while the impulses come in as data, then they're going to send that data off to another region of the brain for interpretation. These are usually called association areas, like a visual association area or an auditory association area. And this is where we're going to take information that comes in and turn it into knowledge, right? Um, so for example, if I'm standing in anatomy class and I smell a fire, but I've never seen a fire before and I've never smelled a fire before, I don't actually see the fire to be able to equate the sense of smell that I'm smelling with the fire. That means that the next time that I smell a fire, I might say, I'm not sure what that is, but it sure smells like anatomy class. In that way, we're associating it with the closest memory without actually being able to associate it with the sense of smell. And that's what I mean by having data without interpretation. So we'll talk about interpretation of the data in each of these special senses as we go along as well. All right, so here's what we showed you previously. We have the olfactory receptor cells, which are going to get a signal from these odorant molecules and then transmit that signal through the cribriform plate up into the olfactory bulb where it synapses with the olfactory neurons and sends that information out through the olfactory tract. From this region, it's then going to end up into the primary olfactory area in the cerebral cortex where it can be interpreted as a sense of smell. So olfactory transduction is basically when we are taking something that is a chemical molecule, in this case an odorant molecule, and we are turning it into an electrical impulse by way of binding it to an olfactory receptor protein. And as soon as this happens, we have a chemical reaction which involves cyclic AMP or a secondary messenger molecule that's going to cause depolarization. You may remember depolarization is what causes nerve impulses. So that's going to create an action potential and that action potential is then going to travel to the primary olfactory area. Now this is just basically collecting the data. From there, we have to send the impulse to a region for odor identification and that region is going to be the frontal lobe for the sense of smell or the orbital frontal area. So how does that work? So we have an odorant molecule that binds to the receptor protein and using a G protein coupled receptor, uh, we're going to then have a conversion using ATP, creating cyclic AMP and cyclic AMP is going to impact the sodium channel by opening it up. And when the sodium channel opens up, sodium is going to influx. Remember sodium is a positive molecule that's going to cause a depolarization, which is then going to trigger an action potential. So that is the sense of smell in a nutshell. So now we're going to move on to the sense of taste. Taste is also a chemical sensation, but it's much simpler than olfaction. So instead of having millions of different odorant molecules that come, come in for interpretation, we only have five primary tastes. Sour, sweet, bitter, salty, and what's called umami or meaty or savory. Any flavors other than umami are just combinations of the other four primary tastes. Now your taste buds are going to be the regions where we have receptors for the sensation of taste. We have over 10,000 taste buds that are found in our mouth, including the tongue, the soft palate, the pharynx, and the epiglottis. Now, as we talked about for the sense of smell, taste buds also have three kinds of cells. The gustatory receptor cells themselves, which are kind of like princess cells and can't really do anything for themselves. The supporting cells, which are going to be there to help support both physically and biochemically support these gustatory receptor cells. And then also basal stem cells, which as you may have guessed, will serve as a reservoir for replenishment and repair for any damaged gustatory receptor cells. So what does this look like? All right, so this here is a valate papilla. Valate papilla are some of the largest papilla, or the largest papilla. We also have filiform papilla, fungiform papilla, etc. Now on a valate papilla, it's gonna look like a little donut with a mini munchkin inside, I suppose. We have a ton of little taste buds. So this is gonna be a congregation, an area where we have a congregation of taste buds. And those taste buds look something like this. So a taste bud starts with a taste pour, at the top of that taste pore, we have microvilli or little mini hairs. Those hairs are actually attached to these receptor cells. Now, not only do we have the receptor cells, of course, we also have the support cells, which help hold the whole thing together. 
And we have the basal cells, which are going to serve as a serve as a stem cell line for replenishment and repair for any receptor cells that are damaged. Now, once we have information coming in in the form of a chemical molecule that initiates this taste receptor cascade, then that receptor cell is going to turn that signal into an electrical signal, send it out by way of the sensory neurons, where then it's going to end up being interpreted later on in the brain. Okay, so we have several different types of papillae. Now, papillae are small elevations on the tongue, and we have valate papilla. We only have 12 of them, but they each are going to have 100 to 300 taste buds. So these are going to be the highest congregation. If you could picture this being like a city, this is the apartment buildings. The fungiform papillae are going to be kind of the outskirts or the suburbs. We have several of them, but they only have about five taste buds each. They're scattered all over. And then we have the foliate papillae, which are located on the lateral trenches of your tongue, and I'll show you where in just a moment. And these are specialty papillae that have taste buds on them only in your youth. And these taste buds are actually very specific for the taste of bitter. This is why many people dislike the taste of, say, Brussels sprouts or lima beans or mushrooms when they are much younger. And then when they become older, because they've lost these taste buds, they are able to detect other tastes inside of those vegetables other than just severe bitter tastes. And so this is why our tastes actually change as we get older, because we lose these lateral um, taste buds, which gives us a better ability to taste food that normally would overwhelm us as bitter. All right, so the filiform papillae cover the entire surface of the tongue. These guys do not have taste buds, but only tactile receptors. That's how I'm speaking with enunciation right now. It also allows you to move food around the mouth, so it helps with speech and with food dispersal when, during the process of mastication or chewing. This is an overview of the tongue. If you look at the tongue, this is the back of the throat, right, the epiglottis which is what's going to be closing off so that you can swallow as opposed to breathing, so it's going to close off the airway from the, um, from the food pipe. Here we have these tonsils, the palatine tonsil and the lingual tonsil, and we'll talk about tonsils when we get to immunology. These are going to be your first line of defense for invading microbes that are going to enter in through the um, oral cavity. But this is what I'd like you to pay attention to. These are the valate papilla. We have 12 of them, four, four, and four, and each of them are going to have hundreds of taste buds each. Again, they look like a little mini donut, but inside with a uh, donut hole. The fungiform papilla are these little guys here, which anyone who's ever had one inflamed, uh, my grandmother used to call them sugar um, sugar blisters. I'm not sure exactly why, sugar bumps. But if you end up with an inflamed fungiform papilla, um, so that can often happen in the very front of the tongue, particularly if you've just burnt your tongue, etc. But it also, I mean, my grandmother was right, it does come from excessive sugar, sugary foods, or it can be associated with that. Um, but I digress. On the side here, these are the foliate papilla. These are the ones that are going to have those taste buds that disappear during the time frame of puberty, essentially. So you're going to have a shift in your ability to taste certain foods. And so if you have only ever hated Brussels sprouts or, um, or mushrooms and you haven't tried them since you were 12, I would recommend that you go out and try some this weekend and see if maybe your tastes have changed as well. All right, so the sense of taste is carried by the cranial nerves. We have three cranial nerves involved. The facial nerve, which is nerve seven, is going to carry information from the front two-thirds of the tongue. The back one-third of the tongue is going to be carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve, or nerve number nine. And the vagus nerve, nerve 10, is going to take information from the taste buds in the epiglottis and in the throat and send that into the brain. So what does that look like? We're going to interpret signals from all three of these nerves. They're going to congregate in the medulla oblongata in what's called the gustatory nucleus and then go to the thalamus. And you'll see this quite often with most of our special senses. They're going to end up congregating in the thalamus where the data is collected, and then that data is going to get sent out for processing. In that case, it's going to get sent out to the primary gustatory area of the cerebral cortex. So this information would come in in the form of this is, some, this is what the taste tastes like, and this information would say that tastes like pizza. So you would actually be putting the information together in the primary gustatory area. Most of the data interpretation areas for our special senses are going to be found in the cerebral cortex. Again, I'm not going to quiz you on that, but just kind of be aware of the fact that information comes in and then gets sent out for interpretation. So data is just data until you know what that data means. All right, so I'm going to move on to the sense of vision now. As we were previously talking about the receptors, we were talking about them being chemical receptors. The receptors for vision are photoreceptors, and they are limited to a very tiny wavelength range of light. So visible light is any light that has a wavelength from about 400 to 700 nanometers. And that's where we get the entire rainbow that we think of for a visible light spectrum. Anything below that includes things like gamma rays, x-rays, and UV rays. 
If we get larger than that in our wavelength, we end up with infrared rays, microwaves, and radio waves. Now, wavelength is just going to be the distance between two consecutive peaks. So if we start here, we're going to end there. If we start here, we're going to end here, right? And that's going to be something that can change. And when we have different wavelengths, we end up with different colors that we're able to interpret from these different wavelengths of light. So before we get into vision, I want to talk about all the accessory structures that help keep your eyes protected. That's going to include your eyelids, your eyelashes, your eyebrows, the tear apparatus or the lacrimal apparatus, which is what helps keep your eye clean in the case of a foreign invader or some sand or something like that, um, and the extrinsic eye muscles that help you look left, right, up, down, and that famous teenager eye roll. The eyelids are called palpebra, so we have the lower eyelid or the lower palpebra, the upper eyelid or the upper palpebra. And then we have the palpable fissure, which is just basically the opening between them. We also have the lacrimal caruncle, which is this area here whereby you're going to first have the water well up when you are to introduce tears to your situation. Some other things that you ought to know, but I'll introduce here is the eyelashes, right? We also have the pupil. Now, the pupil is actually going to be a lack of it's an opening, right? So it's a lack of tissue. So the pupil is an opening in the iris. The iris is the colored part of the eye. They're here shown in, um, in light blue, but we can also have, say, green or brown or several different colors of that iris, which gives us all of our eye colors. All right, so palpebra muscles are going to be muscles that control eyelid movement, since we know that the palpebra is the eye, are the eyelids. And we also have eye muscles that are on the outside, the extrinsic eye muscles, that are, allow you to move the eyeball up down, left, right, and any combination of those. Now as we're working our way in, um, the very first thing that we're going to encounter is the conjunctiva. Now the conjunctiva is a protective membrane. It's going to cover your entire eye in the front. You're actually able to move it around just a little bit. You can picture this like a Ziploc bag on top of the eyeball, and it's actually going to be a pretty strong membrane that's going to protect you from things that might bounce into but not through. For example, grains of sand, etc. And this will allow the lacrimal apparatus or the tear apparatus to rinse these items out without these items actually penetrating into the eye. Um, another thing of interest is the tarsal plate, which is basically going to be how your tissue folds to give form to your eyelids. And there's a ton of sebaceous glands in here. They're also known as tarsal glands. Um, and these are going to secrete oil and grease that's going to keep the um, eyelids from sticking to each other. All right, so if we were to take a sagittal plane and look into the eye, there's a couple new things to introduce here, um, but I'm going to introduce the muscles before I talk about the pathway that light takes. So here we have the superior rectus and the inferior rectus. We also are going to have the inferior oblique. There should be a superior oblique that I don't see. We also have a medial and lateral rectus, which are not going to be shown in this plane. So those are going to be the major muscles that are going to allow the eye to look left, right, up, and down. Um, we also have the orbicularis oculi muscle, which is going to cover the eyelid, and that's also going to run up into the brow. So when you furrow your brow and you get a couple of extra um, lines there, those wrinkles, that's going to be because of the orbicularis oculi muscle pulling things, um, pulling that skin down. We also have, if we're going inward, we have eyelashes, which are going to be our very first layer of protection. Then we have the eyelids or the palpebra. Um, these here are tarsal glands, and they're shown in green. Um, these are going to be glands that are going to help create um, oil and help allow these tarsal folds to occur. So this is how you can let your eye, eye um, lids retreat back into your eye a little bit and not end up stuck back in there. So it allows you to blink basically and keep your eyes open and shut. Um, all right, so let's talk about the path that light passes through as it enters into the eye. We're going to discuss this in great depth in a little bit, but first of all, it has to get through the eyelids, but once it does, then it's going to go through the hole in the iris, which is called the pupil. And that can be larger or smaller depending on the amount of light that's outside in the external environment. Then it has to go through the lens, right? Then it has to go through this region here. So first we have aqueous humor. Then we go through the lens. Then we go through this region is going to be vitreous humor. And it's also called the vitreous chamber, which is filled with vitreous humor. And then it's going to the next thing that we're going to see here at the very back. That's going to be called the retina. And that's where we're going to be focusing light and where we're going to be interpreting light signal. That's where our photoreceptors are. That's the photoreceptor layer. But before we get to that, 
let's step backwards and start talking about the tear pathways. That's called the lacrimal apparatus. Now the lacrimal apparatus produces and drains tears and there's a specific pathway for that. So the first is going to be the lacrimal glands, then to the lacrimal ducts, through the lacrimal puncta, to the lacrimal canicula, into the lacrimal sac, and then draining into the nasal lacrimal ducts that are going to carry tears backwards into the nasal cavity. So what does that look like, you, must, you might ask? So these are the lacrimal glands, and they are going to well up with tears. So when you're about to cry, your face is all puffy, and that's because these lacrimal glands actually are filled with liquid, and they're going to push the under part of your eye, um, underneath your eyebrow is going to get pushed out. Now from the lacrimal glands, liquid will go from the lacrimal duct. From the lacrimal duct, it will go to the lacrimal puncta here, right? And it's going to do that by the superior or the inferior lacrimal caniculus. And so the very first tears that an individual sheds are going to be shed on the internal part of their eye. So if Hollywood has someone where teardrops from the outside of their eye, it's clearly false. So when you're crying very hard, you can well up with tears and start crying from the edge. But the very first tear pretty much always is going to come out of this lacrimal punctal. All the liquid comes out of the lacrimal punctal. So the very first tear is going to fall out of here. Now if the tears don't come out through the eyes, we can have it head into the lacrimal sac and then out through the nasolacrimal duct. This is why sometimes when people are sobbing so hard, they're almost drowning themselves because they truly are having tears pull into their nasal cavity. And this is going to be very important if the tears are due to an actual injury. So instead of having an emotional response, perhaps you just had a bunch of dust or dirt or something thrown in your eyeballs. It's probably also gotten in through your nose. And so this is just a method of flushing everything out to make sure that we're able to eliminate any foreign invaders. So as I mentioned, we have eye muscles that are going to allow you to move the eyes up, down, left, right, etc. And any combination of those allow it to move in pretty much any direction you choose. These muscles are going to include the superior, inferior, lateral, and medial rectus muscles, as well as the superior and inferior oblique muscles. Now, if you're headed from the outside in, the eyeball, eyeball has two major tunics or coats. The first is the fibrous tunic, and that's going to include an area called the cornea, which is the very um, outer region underneath the conjunctiva, and then the sclera, which is the white part of your eye. We also have the vascular tunic, vascular because it has a ton of vasculature, and that's going to include the choroid layer, which is the main vascular layer, the ciliary body, as well as the iris. Those are called the vascular tunic. All right, so if we are looking at the visual axis of light, first the light is going to come in through the cornea, and then it's going to enter into the anterior cavity, which has aqueous humor. That's in the anterior chamber. Then it's going to enter into the posterior chamber by way of going through the pupil and the iris to the posterior chamber. Then it goes through the lens. On the other side of the lens, now it's going to go into the vitreous chamber, which contains the vitreous body or vitreous humor, and get focused in the fovea centralis, which is the central part of your vision. So this is the vision of what you're looking directly towards, and this is anything that's going to be peripheral vision. All right, so there are a couple new things that we've introduced here that we hadn't introduced before. So let's go ahead and get started from the external and work our way in. So again, we had the conjunctiva, which goes right over top of the cornea. The cornea is the clear part of the eye. The sclera is the white part of the eye. It's depicted here. And the sclera doesn't just circle the entire eye. It also is going to cover the optic nerve. So it's going to be a nice protective coat for the entire um, mechanism of vision. So that sclera is going to sit right on top of a choroid layer. This choroid layer is depicted with a lot of red and blue dots. That's because this is the, um, that's going to be the vasculature layer of this, of the eyeball. So it's going to sit just adjacent to the retina. The retina here is depicted as um, as yellow, and this is where we're going to have our photoreceptor layers, this photoreceptor and nervous tissue, etc. Um, a couple of things of notice here, the lens is actually held in place by a ton of these different, um, here's a hyoid canal, this is going to be zonular fibers, a lot of different connective tissue is going to hold this lens in place, and we're actually able to slightly change or distort the lens by squinting, etc., and when we do that, it's because we're moving these ciliary muscles and therefore distorting some of these different connective tissues for the lens. Okay, um, what else am I missing here? Oh, okay, so the optic nerve is going to be the region where all of the neurons are going to congregate and head out into the brain. Because of that, it is the only region in the eye that does not have a photoreceptor layer. So there's no actual photoreceptors here. That makes this the blind spot. This is called the optic disc when all of the neurons come together and funnel out through the optic nerve. It's also known, again, as the blind spot. The fovea centralis is in the very center of the macula lutea, which, again, that's going to be where light is 
properly, if properly focused, is going to be interpreted. Um, I think I've touched on everything here. I do believe so. Okay, so we will move on. Um, so let's talk about how light enters. And light is going to be restricted in its entry based on the size of the pupil. And this is under, um, so dilation is under both sympathetic and parasympathetic um, control. So parasympathetic control would be if the pupil is going to constrict because the iris, the circular muscles of the iris contract. But the iris also has radial muscles, and that's under sympathetic control. So the size of the pupil is dependent on both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic pathways. Um, and under normal light, the pupil appears to be um, a medium size. Under bright light, it appears to be very tiny or pinholes. And under dim light, very large or wide. And as nurses, you'll learn to recognize when a pupil is an abnormal size. And very often, you will recognize that this is associated typically with drug uses. So you might be able to interpret that this individual might not be someone you can rationally deal with immediately by the basis of the size of their pupil. Um, you can also, one of the other things to do is make sure that the eyes are able to follow the light. It's one of the first things that the police officers do if someone is inebriated and if someone is unable to follow the flashlight with their eyes, then they probably are under the influence of some sort of drugs. Um, if not, then they might have a serious head injury or something like that. So if you can rule out drugs, then you might automatically assume they have some sort of neurological imbalance. Um, and again, the size of the pupil is generally based on autonomic reflexes. So these are reflexes that you're not in control of. You can't just wish that your pupil size would get larger or smaller. Although we can use specific drugs, like the eye doctors will dilate your eyes to create the dilation of the pupil. All right, in the back of the eyeball, we have the inner layer known as the retina. And we can use a special tool called an ophthalmoscope to take a look at the retina. Using that ophthalmoscope, we can also see the optic nerve. And the point at which the optic nerve ex exits the eye is known as the optic disc, and this is going to be the blind spot. And in the middle of the retina, we have a region called the macula lutea. The center of this is called the fovea centralis, and this is the area of highest visual acuity. And this is where we want the light to focus off of when it bounces off of something that we're directly focusing on. All right, so if we were to go ahead and look under an ophthalmoscope, here we have the retinal blood vessels. Here we have the optic disc. You'll note that there are no photoreceptors here. This is where all of the nerves are going to be leaving, so the optic nerve is going to be leaving. Uh, we also have the macula lutea and then the fovea centralis, which again, this is going to be the highest point of visual acuity. Um, a little side note about the optic disc. The optic disc is actually going to be on the nasal side, both for the right and the left eye. So what that means is that the optic disc is not in the center, which means that the op the blind spot in the left eye is compensated for by vision that occurs in the right eye, and the blind spot in the right eye is compensated for by the left eye. So in this way, we end up with a full field of vision, even though both eyes have areas that are blind spots, because the blind spots of the left and the right eye do not overlap. All right, so let's talk about the receptors themselves. The receptors are photoreceptors, and there are two different kinds. We have rods and cones. Rods are a little bit more simplified. They're for black and white vision. Cones Color vision, complicated, all start with CO, cones, complicated color. Um, so that's how you can remember the difference between rods and cones. You can also look at them and see the difference because scientists are classic for naming something based on what they look like. So it's a descriptor to these photo, um, these photo sensors, photoreceptors are going to visually look like rods or visually look like cones. But as with any of our special senses, information is going to come into the photoreceptors and then get transferred into nervous tissue, in this case the optic nerve. And it does that by going through multiple layers. We have an outer synaptic layer, we have bipolar cells, then we have an inner synaptic layer, then we have ganglion cells. And that looks kind of like this. And as I mentioned, rods and cones are very visibly different. This is a rod, this is a cone. Um, another point of interest is that cones are specific to the color that they detect. So we have three different colors that are detected, but each cone only detects that one color. If it's a cone that detects blue, it only detects blue, for example. All right, so here we have the pigmented layer of the eye, right? Just going to be towards the back. Embedded in that, we have rods and we have cones, both of which are going to have a little bit of crosstalk. So once they get a signal, they interpret that signal. So they take photo information that comes in as you know, photons of light, and they're going to change it into a chemical signal. So once they interpret that and are going to send off their chemical signal, they're going to do that by passing it from, this is the first layer, the photoreceptor cell layer, which makes sense. That's where the photoreceptors, the rods and the cones are located, into the 
outer synaptic layer, which is here, we have two different kinds of intermediate cells that are going to interpret and share signals. So we have this horizontal cell. The horizontal cell is going to connect this with this one, with that one, and that way information triggered here is going to trigger in a small range of cells that are interconnected. So we're not just going to get trigger of one rod, we'll get many rods in that area. Additionally, we have, so that's the horizontal cells, which just takes information from one to the next and moves it over. We also have bipolar cells, which are going to take information from the rods and the cones and transfer it over into these ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are going to pass information on through the optic nerve axons, and then that impulses are going to propagate along the optic nerve axons and head out toward the optic disc, again towards the optic nerve. Right, again, the direction of nerve impulses through the retina are going to start at that photoreceptor cell. Then it's going to go to that outer synaptic layer, which is where we have our horizontal cells. And then it goes into the bipolar cell layer, which is actually a connection layer between the rods, cones, and these ganglion cells. Ganglion cells. And then it goes to the ganglion cell layer, which is going to send that action potential out towards the optic disc. All right, so what does that look like? Then so we can kind of see this here. We have the um, pigmented layer, then we have the photoreceptor layer, then we have the bipolar cells, etc. Then we have the neural impulses, which are then going, or the neur, sorry. Then we have the axons of the neurons, which send the neural impulses out through the optic nerve. Again, we have the sclera on the outside as a protected layer, the choroid, which is going to have all of our um, blood vessels and blood supply for that photocell layer. And then we also, on top of that, are going to have the actual um, neural layer of the retina. So these are photoreceptors, and then these are neurons. Again, that's all going to be transmitted out through the optic nerve. Oh, additionally, in that optic nerve area, we also have the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein. So a very large amount of blood supply that's going through the here as well. All right, so if you were to divide the eye by where the iris is located, then you would have the anterior chamber, which would be in front of the iris, and the posterior chamber, which is right behind the iris. Now that anterior chamber is filled with aqueous humor. It's a very clear liquid. It's a very watery liquid. Um, and then we have the posterior chamber, again, found right behind the iris, but that's found in front of the lens, and it's also filled with aqueous humor. So you, if the direction that light would travel first would be the anterior chamber through aqueous humor, then through the pupil, which is the hole in the iris, then through the anterior chamber, again filled with aqueous humor, then into the lens, right? And then from there, we would head into the posterior cavity, which is the vitreous chamber filled with vitreous humor. This substance is a little bit more gelatinous. Um, and basically what's going to happen is we're changing density as the light is traveling through these different regions, which is focusing the rays of light, hopefully together, making them convergent in the very back in the, um, the region of highest visual acuity or the fovea. So light's first going to pass through the cornea, then through the anterior chamber, then through the pupil, then through the posterior chamber, then through the lens, then the vitreous humor, and finally get projected onto the retina. Now here's some other things we haven't really talked about. Here's ciliary muscles and ciliary processes, which are going to lead to these zonular fibers, which are going to connect to the lens. As I mentioned, the lens is going to be held in place by a lot of different connective tissue that, that as I referenced previously, is known as these zonular fibers. They're going to be found underneath the iris. Again, the iris has two layers, so we've got one set of muscle that's circular, one set that's radial, that's going to be able to allow for the pupil to change size based on how much light is on the outside. And then here in the front, we have the cornea. Again, this is going to be the anterior chamber that the, is the, so the cornea is on top. Then the anterior chamber, this is filled with um, aqueous humor. And then the posterior chamber, also filled with aqueous humor. And then the lens. And then underneath that, the vitreous chamber, filled with vitreous humor. So this is a summary of all of the structures of the eyeballs and their function. As I mentioned previously, we have both a fibrous and a vascular tunic. The fibrous tunic is going to be composed of the cornea and the sclera. Remember, the sclera is the white part, cornea is the clear part. Um, the vascular tunic is going to be comprised of the iris, which is what's going to be responsible for light regulation and entering the eyeball. So it's going to open and close, changing the size of the pupil, allowing more or less light to flow through. We also have the ciliary bodies. Ciliary bodies is actually going to... Here we go. Uh, I forgot to mention this. The ciliary body, which is comprised of the ciliary muscle and the ciliary process, is also going to be secreting that aqueous humor. So that's how we're going to be replenishing our aqueous humor, and it's connected to the zonular fibers, which is how we're going to be able to change the shape of the lens a little bit if we were to squint, for example. 
Um, and then the choroid layer, which is going to be provide to provide blood supply and also to absorb light that's kind of been scattered um, erroneously. So we're going to be able to eliminate any background information by absorption in the choroid layer. Now the retina itself, this is the most important layer, um, but it's also one of the most fragile layers. This is where we're going to receive and interpret the light, well receive and convert the light into electrical impulses, it'll be interpreted in, in the brain. So the light gets focused again on that fovea centralis, that's going to get turned into receptor potentials and nerve impulses, which are then going to get sent out to the brain through the optic nerve, right, through a, a series of these axons of these multiple ganglion cells coming together to form this optic nerve. Some other structures include the lens, which is, helps refract or bend the light. Um, the anterior cavity, again, it's going to have aqueous humor. It's going to help maintain the shape of the eyeball and also provide nutrients to the lens and the cornea. And then this vitreous chamber region is the vitreous body. It's going to help maintain the shape of the eyeball and also keep the retina tightly attached to the choroid because this vitreous humor is going to be pushing. So it's going to provide pressure um, on that retinal layer to keep it connected to the choroid layer. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about physics. So light is going to change direction, it's going to refract or bend anytime it passes through one substance into another substance that have different densities. And the bending will occur at the junction of the two substances. So for example, if you were spearfishing and you were looking in this direction and you saw a fish which appeared to be here and you thrust your spear here, you would miss the fish. Why? Because although you interpret, your brain interprets the fish to be here, the fish is actually here because the light rays have refracted or bent as they've passed through these different media before they hit your eyes. And so if you're spearfishing, you have to learn to adjust to throw directly in front of where you assume that the fish will be. And the distance between where the fish is and where you interpret the fish is going to increase the deeper this water is. So if it's only a couple inches, the refraction won't change very much, um, change the appearance of the location. But if it's several feet, for example, now all of a sudden if you follow this one here, the further away you get, the further divergent these become. So you end up being able to see things as further and further away from their actual physical physical location. Now on the retina, images are going to be coming in the form of light and they're inverted and reversed right to left. And while that seems a little complicated, your brain will automatically fix that for you. But they're basically backwards and upside down, right? Inside out. And the brain again is going to compensate for that for, without any problem. Now, the lens is responsible for focus. So the lens is what's going to, if you squint, you can kind of change to be able to see things. And if we are unable to focus because we have something like far-sighted vision or near-sighted vision, we will end up using external lenses, either contact lenses or glasses, to change the rays of the light before they even come into the eye. Ideally, however, light is going to be projected on the back region of the retina in the central phobia, and if it's sharp, right, hopefully it's clear and we don't have myopic or, uh, or we don't have improper vision, right, nearsighted or farsighted vision, we're going to have a nice sharp crystal clear image on that central phobia. Now, objects that are far away are going to come in with parallel rays of light. Objects that are closer are going to have what's called divergent rays of light in that they're um, going opposite directions. Either way, they're going to go into the, in, in, through the cornea, through the aqueous humor, through the lens, and then get projected onto the fovea. Now, as you mentioned, this is inside out and backwards. It's upside down and backwards, right? But again, your brain's going to compensate for that very easily. Um, and now, if, for example, something is very close, you might have to change the shape of the lens. That's what this image is depicting. So here's the original lens where we have nearby parallel rays. If we have divergent rays in order to make it a clear image, we may have to squint a little bit to adjust the shape of the lens to make sure that it's focused in the correct region. And we can only do that with a little bit of wiggle room. Um, again, if we end up having to focus too, if we're too far out of focus, we're going to have to have corrective vision, corrective lenses. Now, a normal eye, it's considered emtropic. And this is when the vision is going to have the light refracted correctly and focused directly on the retina. So the focus is here. If you can picture these, these rays would continue out, they would diverge again, right? Now, sometimes people have nearsightedness or myopic conditions, and this is generally has to do with the shape of the eyeball. So if the eyeball is a little bit longer than normal, then the image converges in front of the retina instead of on the retina. 
Oftentimes these people are able to see close objects very well, but distant objects are going to be blurry. And in order to correct this, we're going to give them a concave lens, either in the terms of a corrective lens like glasses or corrective lenses like contacts. Now if we add that concave lens, we can change the direction that the light is actually coming in. So we can refract the light before it goes in to be refracted again. And in that way we can compensate and have the vision corrected. So we can have the nearsighted eye corrected in that it's focused instead of being focused in front of the retina, it's focused on the retina. And the opposite is true for hyperopia or hypermetropia or farsightedness. In this case, the eyeball is far shorter than it ought to be and the image is going to actually converge behind the retina and so we'll use a convex lens to correct that abnormality whereby we, instead of focusing behind the retina, now we've adjusted and they're going to focus again on the retina so now we're able to clarify and get clearer vision. Some other things that can happen is something called astigmatism. Now astigmatism is when either the cornea or the lens, often both, has an odd shape to it or an irregular curve which causes distorted vision. And these actually are going to have specialty, um, either glasses or contacts. And that's because you're going to have to have contacts that sit in a particular location on your eye. They cannot rotate around because they have to match the odd shape of the cornea or the lens. All right, so that covers corrective vision, but let's talk about how normal vision works. So now we're talking back about our photoreceptors. Again, we have two of them. We have rods and cones. Um, rods look just like rods. They're for um, black and white vision. Cones are a little bit more complicated, and they're for color vision. Again, cones, complicated color vision. But the idea is that these are receptors, and then in this case, they're photoreceptors, but they're converting something that is non-electrical, in this case, lights, photon, right, little photons of light, um, into neural impulses. And again, they were named because they appear to be rods and they appear to be cones. Now these contain something called photopigments. And photopigments are required for the absorption of light in order to initiate a receptor potential, which will then get sent out through the nervous tissue, through the optic nerve to be interpreted in the brain. Now rods being black and white contain only rhodopsin, so just one molecule. We'll talk about how that works, and it basically is all on or all off for that particular rod. However, cones have three different photopigments. And now when I say that, each cone only has one. So there are three separate types of cones, red cones, green cones, and blue cones. Red only detects red, green only detects green, blue only detects blue. So there's no crosstalk between what the cones are able to detect. But all these photopigments respond to light in what's called a cyclical process. So what that means is that we have to reset the system. We can only knock down the dominoes once before we have to put all the dominoes back up, and then we can knock the dominoes down again. What do I mean by that? I mean that there's a little bit of a delay between photo bleaching and being able to restore and then re-see with light. So let's take a look at the rod discs here. They have these little rhodopsin molecules connected to it. When rhodopsin is in its colored form, which means that it's able to react to light, it's got the cis retinol, which has a little kink to it, and it's bound in the opsin molecule. Now when light comes in, it isomerizes retinol and it changes from cis to trans, which means that it no longer fits snugly in the opsin molecule and can pop out. Trans retinol, separate from opsin, is now a colorless product. So here we have colored photopigment, now we have a colorless product that's called bleaching. And it takes a little bit of time, not very long, but milliseconds, for the retinal isomerase to reconvert trans to cis retinal and pop it back into the opsin molecule. So this is what I mean by resetting the dominoes. When you knock down the dominoes or cause the conversion of retinol to be the trans retinol version popping out of opsin, it takes a second to reset the system to be able to allow that to happen again. And that was what we're going to refer to when we talk about light adaptation. So light adaptation happens when an individual moves from the dark surroundings to a light ones. Picture stepping out of a dark movie theater into a bright light. It takes seconds to be able to visually understand what's happening because at first you have nothing but completely white light. And that's because it's called photo bleaching, right? All of the rods in the area that just got flashed with bright light are going to take a moment to reset. And by that point, hopefully your pupil has adjusted and shrunk down a little bit to allow less light in, so now you can actually interpret the light signals that are being presented to the retina. Now dark adaptation is the opposite of light adaptation. It takes place when one moves from a light area into a dark room picture stepping into a dark movie theater. Now this takes several minutes to complete, and that is because there's a separate process. So it's not just changing the amount of light that comes in, 
by changing the shape and size, not the shape, changing the size of the pupil. Um, but we also have an inhibitory neurotransmitter called glutamate that is involved in the dark adaptation response. Now again, as I mentioned, the light adaptation happens because we have bleaching and regeneration and it takes a second or two, a millisecond or two to be able to reset the dominoes for the photo bleaching to occur again. Um, so the reaction can't occur until the entire process has been reset for all of the rods that have been affected. However, when we're talking about dark adaptation, we also need to talk about glutamate, which again is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So how does this work? So in light conditions, we have very low amounts of glutamate. So if we have high light, we have low amounts of glutamate. And that happens because we have this retinol isomerization that's going to occur. And when that happens, it's going to make cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP is going to um, close those sodium channels. Remember, sodium coming in is what's going to create our action potential. Um, and as the sodium influx closes, slows down, we're going to have a hyperpolarization of that membrane potential. Um, and that, in turn, is going to mean that we have less glutamate turned on, right? So the release is turned off. That's going to mean that we are going to send information out through the bipolar cell almost immediately. Now, in darkness, there's an inhibitory neurotransmitter called glutamate. And this is so that we can help fine-tune in the dark the receptors and the information coming into the receptors. So as you might imagine, if we weren't able to fine tune it, we would only see black. But in the darkness, we have to be able to slow down the information being transmitted. And we do that by a neuro in inhibitory neurotransmitter, again, that's called glutamate. And this is going to slow down how fast the signal is sent from the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells. And the ganglion cells are going to send information to the retina. And this is basically allowing us to fine tune the shades of gray. So again, in darkness, we're going to have more glutamate created, which again is going to slow down the signal from the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells, which means that we're going to be able to interpret more of the shades of gray. Okay, so just like any of these special senses, the neural pathway starts when we're converting some sort of non-electrical signal, in this case, light energy, into neural signals or electrical signals that are then directed through the nerves. In the case of vision, they're directed through the optic nerves. And that pathway is via the optic chiasm to the optic tract to the thalamus. In fact, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Again, you're going to see the thalamus a lot. The thalamus is going to be a region where data comes in and gets stored. But then from the thalamus, information has to get sent out for interpretation. And that's done by optic radiations that are going to go to regions of the brain, like the primary visual areas of the occipital lobes, where we're actually going to interpret the data that we have collected. Now, again, I'm never going to ask you to describe the particular paths that any of these neurons travel through the brain. But just like we saw previously, we have information coming in. In this case, it comes in through the optic nerve, travels through the optic chiasm, which is this region here, kind of like an intersection, through the optic tract, going to meet in the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. This is where data is going to be stored as data, and then data is going to be sent out for interpretation through these optic radiations to the primary visual area of the cerebral cortex and the occipital lobe. Again, I'm not going to ask you the specifics of that, but be aware that in all cases, data comes into one location and is interpreted in another location. Okay, so as you may know, we as humans have binocular vision, and that's because we have visual overlap of our visual fields. But it's not entirely overlap, right? If you close your left eye, you still lose a little bit of vision. You close your right eye, you lose a little bit of peripheral vision on the right. So while we do have overlap, so this is, would be a region where both the left eye and the right eye see, we also have an extended visual field of the left eye, which is a little bit more than the right, and an extended visual field of the right eye, which is a little bit more than the left. Just to be clear, the blind spots are going to fall here and here, so in areas that we have overlap of our visual fields, so they're going to compensate for one another. And another interesting thing that occurs is that everything that's from our left visual fields, again, that would be the left side of our left and the left side of our right eye, is going to be processed in a different part of our brain than everything from the right visual fields. Again, that would be the right side of our right eye and the right side of our left eye. So what's happening is our left visual fields and our right visual fields are actually crossing streams at the optic chiasm. All of our right visual fields go to the left part of the brain. All of our left visual fields go to the right part of the brain, again, into the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and then out through these optic radiations to the primary visual association area of the brain. 
Now again, each eye has two visual fields, the nasal visual field and the temporal visual field, and this is what I was saying from the left and the right half, so we have the medial and the temporal visual fields of the eye. And visual information from the right half travels, of both visual fields, travels to the left side of the brain. Visual information from the left half of both visual fields travels to the right side of the brain. So then again, this is kind of what it looks like. So the visual half, um, the visual field of the left eye is split up into the temporal and the nasal half. And again, this left half goes to the right side. Again, the left half goes to the right side. And the right half, which is the nasal half for the left eye, but will be the temporal half for the right eye because of how we describe these items, that's going to then end up going off to the left half of the brain. Again, they're going to end up terminating at the lateral geniculate nucleus in terms of data storage and then not maybe not terminating, having a second set of interpretation that has to happen when they go out through those optic radiations to the primary visual area of the cerebral cortex. All right, guys, so that wraps up vision. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is hearing and equilibrium. Now, the transduction of sound vibrations into electrical signals is far faster than the response to light by the eye's photoreceptors. And I had a student in class who raised their hand and asked, well, then why is it that I see lightning first and hear thunder later? And that's because light does travel much faster than sound. So it truly did get to the individual faster. So light makes it to you faster than sound makes it to you, but you interpret sound faster than light if they were both given to you at the same time. Now, the ear has receptors for both hearing and equilibrium. That's the vestibular cochlear organ that does that, and we'll talk about that in a second. But first, let's talk about the major regions of the ear. We have the external ear, the middle ear, and the internal ear. And the external ear is everything that's on the outside, including the auricle, which is the helix and the lobule. That's what you actually see when you see the ear. Um, it's going to be held up by elastic cartilage and surrounded by a good bit of, um, of like fatty tissue. And then we also are going to have, this is the external auditory canal, so this is where the sound waves are going to travel. This is depicting a little bit of cerumen or earwax, which helps keep um, foreign invaders out of the ear. So it's going to be one of the first places that's going to be kind of gooey, and it'll catch any sort of microbes that might be invading. This is the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is also known as the eardrum, and this is where it's, the sound waves are going to be received and interpreted. So that old question, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? And the answer is no, because it's not sound waves until it's interpreted, it's just pressure waves. So you're going to see it called sound waves, but sound waves actually have to do with interpretation, otherwise it's just pressure of the air. So um, the pressure of the air is going to come on through here and going to hit the tympanic membrane, also known as the eardrum, which is going to cause vibrations in the malus, the incus, and amplify that into the stapes almost 20-fold more than as it came into the tympanic membrane. The malus, the incus, and the stapes are depicted here as embedded in the temporal bone, but, be, um, but don't be fooled. They are actually um, kind of dangling inside. So they're not embedded on, they're not in contact with the temporal bone, although they are attached to the temporal bone. And that allows them to undergo vibration and amplification of that vibration. Now, when that vibration reaches the stapes, it's going to pound in this oval window. The oval window is then going to take that information and send it over to the cochlea. And we'll talk about how the cochlea works in a second. The cochlea is the organ of hearing, and this vestibule is the organ of, um, of equilibrium. The vestibular cochlear organ is going to send out information, the vestibular cochlear nerve. So here's the cochlear branch or the branch associated with hearing and the vestibular branch or the branch associated with equilibrium. And again, they're all going to then end up being interpreted in the brain. Some other things of interest here. So this is going to be the, um, the middle ear and then that's going to include this region here, which is the auditory tube, which connects to the nasopharynx. So if you equalize your ears by holding your nose and blowing pressure internally and it comes up through here, that's how that's working. This nasopharynx is going to be pushing air into the auditory tube. Um, so there is some connection here. This is why if you are, end up with an ear infection, they're told not to go scuba diving, etc., or not to go on a plane. And that's because if this is blocked, you can end up with severe pressure inside here if you can't equalize it, which can cause damage to the tympanic membrane. All right, so again, the external ear contains the auricle, external auditory canal, and the eardrum. Now, the auricle captures sound waves, and those sound waves are going to get transmitted to the eardrum by the external auditory canal. We also have ceraminous glands, which are going to secrete cerumen or earwax, 
to help protect the canal and the eardrum. Now that middle ear is going to contain those three, we call them auditory ossicles. That's the malus, the incus, and the stapes. Again, these are going to be kind of free floating. They're hanging in the temporal bone, but they are not actually in contact with the temporal bone. This allows them to vibrate. Again, vibrations are going to come in through the tympanic membrane and then get amplified as they travel through the malus, then the incus, and then the stapes. And the stapes is going to have, so that's the stirrup, if you remember the hammer anvil and stirrup, that's the one that's going to fit into the oval window of the vestibular cochlear organ. Now again, that auditory tube is going to extend from the middle ear all the way into the nasopharynx, and it's going to be involved in regulation of air pressure, as I just mentioned. All right, so this is showing you the external ear and the internal, I'm sorry, and the middle ear and the internal ear. Now, the middle ear is going to be comprised of the malus, the incus, and the stapes, as I mentioned. Now, this allows you to see the, how tiny these ligaments are that are holding the lateral ligament of the malus, anterior ligament of the malus, superior ligament of the malus. These are all holding these small auditory obstacles in place and allow the vibration to occur. Now, the inner ear... It's called a labyrinth, and that's going to have this, it looks like a, a snail, it's a snail organ. It's basically going to have two regions. You have the cochlear region and the vestibular region. The cochlear region is going to take information in the form of vibrations and turn them into neural impulses that are going to be interpreted as sound. And the vestibular region is going to be comprised of semicircular canals that have ampulla at the end of them, and the, they're going to function in terms of interpreting balance and equilibrium from the cerebellum is responsible for that interpretation. Okay, so again, this is our vestibular region, this is our cochlear region, and this is the stapes. The stapes is going to have pressure in the oval window, and when that pressure occurs, we're going to head over to the cochlea, which is involved in sound. And basically what happens is the pressure wave is going to go up the spiral staircase and then back down the spiral staircase, and it's going to have pressure inside that's going to be interpreted in the cochlea. Now if we're looking at the vestibule, the vestibule has three different semicircular canals and as is very obvious here, they are in three different planes of orientation. So we have an X, a Y, and a Z semicircular canal. Those are known as the anterior, posterior, and lateral, probably not in order. And each of them are going to be filled with um, two different things. So we have the bony labyrinth, which is the outer region that's going to contain perilymph, and the membranous labyrinth, which is going to contain endolymph. And really all you need to know about perilymph and endolymph is that they have different densities, and therefore you're going to be able to make different detections with them. All right, at the bottom of each of our semicircular canals, we have ampulla, ampulla region here, here, um, and the ampulla are going to help us detect um, acceleration and deceleration and other types of moment or movement. We also have this region here called the utricle. Come on, utricle is where the ampulla are going to connect. And then the saccule right here is going to be at the very end. This whole thing is called the vestibule, which is why we have the vestibular cochlear designations. All right, so now we're going to talk about the sense of hearing as opposed to the sense of equilibrium. So vibrations, again, they're coming through the malus, the incus, and the stapes, 20 times more vigorous than when they hit the tympanic membrane, so they've been amplified. And that's going to cause pressure waves. So we had sound waves, which are really just air pressure that's going to be different, that's going to then get interpreted as we head through the cochlea. So those that's air waves or air pressure that then gets turned into fluid pressure waves that are transmitted into the perilymph of the scala vestibuli. Now we have the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. And as I mentioned previously, I'm going to go back one. The first thing that has to happen is you have to go up the spiral staircase and then you have to come down the spiral staircase. And that's going to happen in two different regions. Now going up the spiral staircase is going to be called the scala vestibuli. Why? Because you're coming from the vestibule side. Coming back down the staircase is called the scala tympani. Why? Because this round window is a tympanic membrane as well, and so you're headed towards the tympanic membrane. So you're headed from the vestibule towards the tympanic membrane. All right? Now inside, we have the perilymph and endolymph, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the next slide, which will show the cross section. So here we have the stapes. Again, here we are only focusing on the cochlear region. We're not focusing on the vestibulum. Here we have the stapes. We have pressure waves that are coming through 20-fold more vigorous. They're going to go into this gray region here, which is known as the scala vestibuli. We're going to go up the spiral staircase. 
And then when you get to the top, before you can go back down the spiral staircase, that region is called the helicotrema. That is the connection point between the top spiral and the bottom spiral staircase, or the connection between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. All right? So as you might imagine, pressure waves are going to be different when you're going up than when you're coming down. So if you picture you just walked up a spiral staircase, maybe you had a lot of energy going in, but now you're a little bit tired and to go down, you might be a little bit slower. So there's going to be a difference in pressure between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. Now as this comes back down, right, so it goes up the scala vestibuli, goes through the helicotrema, and then comes back down the scala tympani. As it comes back down, any extra pressure that is going to be left is going to get off um, or released here through the scala, um, sorry, released here through this round window through a secondary tympanic membrane. From So the scala tympani is going to then release any extra pressure through this tympanic membrane. All right, but how is it interpreted, you might ask, and that's where it gets just a little bit more complicated. So we've taken a cross section here to include both the scala vestibuli, the scala um, tympani, and this region here, which is called the cochlear duct, which is going to lie in between the two. And that's what we're doing is we're detecting the pressure changes between these two. Also, to keep you posted, we have different fluid in the upper and lower staircases than we do in the cochlear duct. So we're going to take a cross section right here and amplify that for you right now. Again, um, in this organ, we're going to have pressure waves going up the scala vestibuli and then coming back down the scala tympani. So this would be the upward staircase and the downward staircase. Note that both the vestibuli and the scala tympani are going to contain perilymph, so a particular type of liquid. Inside the cochlear duct, we're going to have a different type of liquid, the endolymph, which are, of course, going to have different densities, which allows for detection of different pressure changes. Now, in between the scala tympani, and the endolymph of the cochlear duct, we have what's called the spiral organ. And this is going to be a full spiral in the snail shell. And this is going to run along the entire region in between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani, specifically between the scala tympani and the endolymph of the cochlear duct. And this is where the signal is interpreted. This is known as the organ of Corgi. And on top of this, we have a tectoral membrane. So let's amplify that region right now. Basically, as I mentioned previously, we have pressure waves traveling through the scala vestibuli, and that's going to then be detected via the vestibular membrane and the endolymph of the cochlear duct. So we have a basilar membrane, which is going to cause vibrations, which moves hair cells on that spiral organ that's also known as the organ of Corti against the tectoral membrane. And this might not make much sense to you right now, but as soon as I show you an image, it will help you, I promise. Okay, so here is the basal, basilar membrane, and here are the cells that line the scala tympani. And we have specialty cells that are the support cells because, as usual, the receptor cells can't carry their own weight. They are specialized only for interpretation of, in this case, mechanical signal. And that means that they have to have cells that basically take care of them. And that's going to be these support cells here. Each of our receptor cells are going to have outer hair cells that are connected to that tectoral membrane. And as you might imagine, as pressure changes occur, we're going to have motion that's going to occur in across the tectoral membrane, changing the direction or the angle of the stereocilia relative to those outer hair cells. And that information is going to propagate a nerve impulse through these sensory and motor fibers out through the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Okay, so this is kind of an overview of what happens. So first, we have information coming out in what we're going to call sound waves, but again, these are just air pressure waves that are going to come across this tympanic membrane. And as you'll note, because the tympanic membrane is kind of tilted, this allows us to catch multiple different wavelengths of sound, right? So the vibrations can be... Um, can come in in multiple different regions and be collected across that entire tympanic membrane. And of course, then they're going to be transferred to the malus, to the incus, and the stapes, where they're amplified 20-fold, if not more, and that pressure is then pushed into the oval window of the stapes. From there, the perilymph of the scala vestibuli is going to have a pressure change occur. It's going to go up the spiral staircase and then down the spiral staircase of so the scala tympani. Again, that connection between the upper and the lower part is called the helicotrema. And inside this whole region, we have this endolymph region, which is shown here um, as the cochlear duct. It's got that pink line. That is going to be where we have endolymph. 
and we have the basilar membrane. And so information that's going to be interpreted as the pressure changes between here and here is going to get sent out through the organ of Corgi into the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, right, into this region, the cochlear branch. Um, but we also have the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, which has regions that are going to innervate the saccule or the saccular nerves, the down here, or the utricle or the utricle nerves, and also the ampulla or the ampullary nerves. Um, so we're going to be interpreting data from this region in the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, and that's going to be interpreted as equilibrium. Okay, so once we have information that gets sent through the cochlear branch, of the vestibular cochlear nerve, that's going to end up synapsing in the medulla oblongata with neurons of the cochlear nuclei, right, so in the medulla oblongata, and then get transferred to the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Remember, we've heard the thalamus before is an area where data is going to get sent, and then it's going to get sent out for interpretation, which is going to occur in the primary auditory area of the cerebral cortex, and that occurs in the temporal lobe. Again, I'm not going to ask you the specifics of where they end up in the brain, but you do need to know that they're going to congregate, in this case, in the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and then have that information sent back out for interpretation, in this case, the primary auditory area in the cerebral cortex. Okay, so that covers hearing. Um, so now we are going to move on to um, equilibrium, and equilibrium exists in both static and dynamic equilibrium forms. So basically, whether you are moving or staying still. So the equilibrium of where you are present when you're not moving versus the equilibrium of where you are when you are moving, right? The equi equilibrium of motion. And that's known as dynamic equilibrium. And that's all going to be detected by the vestibular apparatus. So the vestibular apparatus is going to include um, organs that are going to maintain equilibrium, such as the saccule, the utricle, um, and the semicircular canals. Now, the saccule and the utricle are both what's called otolithic organs, and this is going to be a, a word you've not heard before today, unless you've heard it, it elsewhere, um, but otolithic organs are organs that are going to work with um, these otoliths, and what's an otolith? So an otolith is a calcium carbonate crystal. You can picture this like a large rock, basically. Um, and the saccule and the utricle are, have regions um, of the walls that have what's called a macula. And these macula are areas that are receptors for what's called static equilibrium. Okay, so otoliths seem like a very odd concept. Why do we have calcium carbonate crystals? Why do we have these rocks, right? And... In fact, I'm going to move forward to be able to show you before I try to describe it to you. But basically, we have this otolithic membrane that sits on top of the macula. And the otolithic membrane is called such because it has these little otoliths or calcium crystals in there. Um, and these uh, calcium carbonate crystals have some weight to them. And so what will happen is that... Um, if gravity pulls the otolithic membrane one direction or the other, that will affect these little hair cells. And these hair cells have little hair bundles that stick out of them that are embedded directly in the otolithic membrane. And again, as the otolithic membrane slides one direction or another, the angle at which these hair bundles interact with the hair cells will change. And that information will be sent out via these sensory fibers to be able to be interpreted in terms of equilibrium. Okay, again, here's our utricle and our saccule. These are the ampulla. These are the semicircular canals. You can see they are in A, B, I'm sorry, well, a, B, and C, X, Y, and Z planes is what I meant to say. Um, so if we look at this in detail, these are the otoliths sitting on top of the otolithic membrane, and we have hair bundles that are shoved right into that otolithic membrane. They're comprised of cilia, kenocilium, and stereocilia. And these hair cells are going to have the angle of their hair bundles relative to themselves change as the otoliths and the otolithic membrane move around um, as gravity plays a role on them. Just like we've seen in other receptors, we have support cells, which are going to not only physically support them, but also biochemically support these receptor cells. Um, and that's going to be part of your dynamic equilibrium. Now, we also have semicircular canals. I'm sorry, this is part of your static equilibrium. Well, um, the semicircular canals are part of dynamic equilibrium, and these are going to allow us to detect not just where we are relative to our surroundings, or really relative to the force of gravity, which is what acts on the otoliths, 
but it's also going to allow us to determine rotational acceleration or deceleration. And that's going to, so basically the change in where we are from where we were. And that's going to happen because of something called crista in the ampulla. Each crista has a group of hair cells inside of them and movement of the head. So if you shake left to right, etc., that's going to affect the liquid inside, which again in this case is endolymph. And it's also going to affect the hair cells within that endolymph, which is then going to lead to the generation of a nerve impulse. And again, because we're dealing with equilibrium, that's going to be the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So now that we're looking in the ampulla, now we can talk about um, deceleration and acceleration because we have something very similar to what we saw before, but instead of otoliths, otoliths or any sort of um, otolithic membrane, we now have what's called a cupula. The cupula looks very similar in that the hair bundles are still embedded in it and the hair cells are going to be able to detect the change in the directionality of the hair bundles relative to the body of the hair cell. Again, we have the support cells which are going to help keep them electrically insulated from one another and also physically support them as well as nutritionally support them. And all of this is going to be in endolymph. So everything that's not depicted or what looks like it's empty is actually going to have endolymph. This whole thing, the hair bundle, hair cell, and the supporting cell, are called, it's called a criste or a crista. Okay, so if your head's not moving, the cupula is going to be directly above, inside the ampulla. Again, this is all filled with endolymph. But if your head is moving or rotating, the cupula is going to be dragged through the endolymph, which is then going to mean that the cupula is bent in the opposite direction of the rotational force. So as you rotate left, endolymph is dragged right, etc. And then that information is going to get transferred into nervous impulses, which gets sent out through the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve and then are going to congregate in the vestibular nuclei and eventually make it to the posterior nucleus of the thalamus. Again, a lot of these impulses are going to end up um, having a, a layover or a bus stop layover at the thalamus where the data is sent, and then the data will be sent out for interpretation in the vestibular area of the cerebral cortex. All right, so to summarize some of the structures of the ear, we have the auricle or the outer region. It's going to include the auricle, external auditory canal and the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. So it's all going to be the external ear. And that's going to stop at the eardrum. From the eardrum over is going to be the middle ear. That's going to include the auditory ossicles and the auditory or eustachian tubes. Again, that's how you're going to equalize your ear pressure. And the inner ear is going to consist of this snail organ that we talked about, which is going to help keep, keep um, both sense of hearing and sense of equilibrium. That's going to include the cochlea, the vestibular apparatus, which includes the semicircular ducts, again in X, Y, and Z planes, the utricle, the saccule, and then each of these ducts are also going to have ampulla as well. And all of that information is then going to get interpreted as your sense of equilibrium or balance. Okay, so I'm going to skip through development because we're not going to discuss development in this class, but I did leave it in here in case any of you have any interest in taking a developmental biology course later on, but I will not quiz you on anything about development. So I'm going to skip through. Um, so let's talk about aging in the special senses. So as you get older, the special senses do start to fade. Um, around age 50, you will have a gradual loss of smell and taste. This is why grandma might sometimes smell like she dr drowned herself in the entire bottle of perfume because truly after a couple of spurts, she couldn't smell it, so she used more. Um, whereas you, who have younger... Um, ability to smell, you're going to a younger olfaction, you're going to be able to detect that perfume much more easily. Um, additionally, sense of taste can, lose, can get lost, which is why some elderly people always keep a bottle of hot sauce in their purse, for example. Um, in terms of vision, the lens is going to start losing its elasticity and it's going to have a difficulty focusing on objects. Oftentimes, that's going to affect close vision, so it's going to be, that's called um, a press biopia. This begins around age 40. This is why some older people might hold the newspaper at arm's length even while wearing glasses, because they truly can't see anything up close because they have lost the ability, or the lens has lost the ability to be able to squint to focus up close. Um, additionally, the muscles of the iris weaken and are going to have um, a slower ability to adjust to light and dark. So sometimes elderly people have uh, very harsh difficulties adjusting from light to dark or from dark to light. So they have difficulties adjusting to changes in lighting, which is why grandma might have every light on in the entire house. Um, and Additionally, in the eye, we can have some retinal diseases, things like macular degeneration, detached retina, and glaucoma. 
Um, these are also going to occur more frequently in the elderly patients. And by about 60, 25% of individuals are going to experience a noticeable hearing loss. That's called presbycusis or age-associated hearing loss. Another thing that can happen is we can have ringing in the ears or a vestibular imbalance because of the fact that the receptors in the vestibular organ might either have lost some of their sensitivity or they might just have a slower reaction time and all of that can lead to problems with equilibrium in the elderly patients. All right, guys, so that's our talk for today. I really appreciate you sticking around. Thank you so very much. Aloha and happy studying. Have a great day.